A very good morning and welcome to the East African Round of Debates out of Kigali, Rwanda. This morning we'll be looking at the East African aviation sector, looking at what are the challenges that we've been facing, what, uh, what is stopping us for, from staying in the airs, and what are the opportunities, because that is the bigger conversation. Joining me this morning is an eminent panel of experts in this space who will be helping us unwrap these issues around the East African space. Very quickly, allow me to introduce my panel this morning. I'll start from uh, Silas uh, Udahemuka. He is a Director General at the Rwanda Civil Aviation Authority. Also on this panel, I have Fred Seka, Chairman of the Rwanda Freight Forwarders Association. Also, Patrick Nkuliyimfura, MD, Akagera Aviation. Joining us from Nairobi is Maslin Gatebi. She's a research analyst with Genghis Capital Limited in Kenya. My name is Bonnie Tunya, and this is CNBC. Gentlemen and lady, I'd like us to start with a bit of an overview because a lot of different things have been said about uh, the aviation sector. And I'd, I'd like to, to start with Silas. Uh, from where you see it mostly as a regulator, uh, give us a, a bit of the trends you've observed in this sector in terms of where we are and where we could grow. Uh, thank you for inviting us in your studio here to allow us to share current status of the aviation industry in this country and, uh, and in the region. Aviation is a time-tested industry. We are not going to reinvent the wheel here. We are only going to continue to improve. Whatever is being done is improving the performance of the industry and mainly looking at enhancing safety, security and efficiency of uh, its performance. Aviation has been facing challenges time immemorial from its beginning. It will continues to face so many challenges. It will be facing so many challenges, even in many years to come. But people have been able to come uh, around those problems and have been able to find solutions. But what we need to do is to be ahead of problems right. and prepare in very good time. At the regional level today, we, we are nearly all in the infancy of this business. But the performance is going, going very well in terms of safety and, and, and security. So, so we are above average uh, in the region. Right. Let me just bring uh, Fred in this conversation. Fred, IATA has predicted that uh, uh, global aviation is going to grow in the next two years. However, when you look at African aviation space, if you look at uh, the challenges uh, in Kenya, Kenya Airways, if you look at Ethiopia Airlines, yes, it's growing, but uh, we still have a very difficult operating environment. Give us a sense of what you feel about the growth of the sector in the next few years. Uh, thank you so much. Um, um, as I said, uh, my colleague here, um, I may say, as Ayata said, the uh, aviation industry is growing well in the, in the world, also in the East Africa region. As I see, uh, Kenya is coming, as Rwanda is booming, is coming. For us, as uh, the business community, we are looking at that as a policy or the big opportunity are coming in the region. We are saying the Ayata is here to qualify the aviation and the as I call is there to qualify the CE, where we are saying that well, for us as a business community who are working daily basis with these airlines, we look that for the opportunity, how business community should be uh, having this opportunity and gain more right. in the region. Right. In, terms, in terms of the security, when the airlines have the security, and the airlines come to get the raw price, like the rates, we work as a rates. Those things, when the region put together, this opportunity for the growing the airlines aviation will give us the opportunity and making more business and profit and also growing also our economy for the region. Right. Thank you. Uh, Patrick, yeah, the space you play in is, is very interesting because you're also backed by uh, a very important sector that is tourism. Give us a feel of what Akagera does um, in the wider scheme of things as far as the East African aviation is concerned. What we are doing at Akagera Aviation uh, when it comes to the uh, regional uh, perspective mm -hmm. of our sector, when it comes to tourism, is that we are working very closely with the East African uh, platform, tourism platform. Um, the good thing is that there was even recently a big meeting in Kigali mm -hmm. where we sat down with all the biggest tour operators in Kenya, all the, um, the, um, the, the Ugandan um, tourism board and also stakeholders in Rwanda we, in tourism and say since we are promoting the region 
from one angle, thanks to our leadership, right. thanks to the president, the head of states that actually promoted the, the one visa for the, the entire the three countries. What can we exploit together as an entity that can actually not only help Kenya, not only help Uganda, not only uh, help Rwanda. We came up with a roadmap, and, and the good things about it is that we are developing statistics that will not only be an, a national statistics, but it will be actually a block as such. And it will uh, enhance not only economy of scales, but at the same time, uh, opportunities when it comes to cross-boarding uh, tourism coming into this country with the facility of that one visa for the region. And I, I do believe that it's a very, very good step in the right direction in right. order to grow the sector, but also in order to grow the tourism number coming into our region. Right. Uh, gentlemen, let me just bring in Maslin in this conversation. Maslin, um, National Career Kenya Airways is uh, obviously listed uh, uh, on the exchange, and you've been observing the performance of this. In the wake of this uh, focused by IATA saying that uh, we do expect aviation as a sector to continue growing, um, what is the investor point of view as far as aviation is concerned in the region? Okay, thank you, Bonnie. Um, looking at the aviation industry in Kenya, we have seen a very fragile industry, especially coming from the point whereby we have been experiencing a lot of hiccups, mainly coming from the Ebola attacks and the downfall in the tourism industry. Basically, what, we, what this spells for us is that the airline business has been very cyclical. There are years whereby, whereby the industry has been very good. But also we have come to a point whereby the industry has been beaten badly because of the pressures coming from the macroeconomic environments and also the political environment. So again, looking at the IATA projections, I, I still feel like the East African industry may not really meet up to the expectations of IATA. However, this is bound to change maybe in, an, in some years to come. But for now, this may not change and we don't expect much growth in the airline industry in East Africa. Interesting, Marceline. Um, which then begs the question, what must we do? Because we all realize that this sector is very important. Uh, this sector, um, like uh, Patrick pointed out, it's supporting other sectors like tourism and trade and whatnot. The question is, what are mm. our opportunities? And one of the things that people have put out is regional integration. How then do we go about this? And I was uh, very interested to hear what uh, Silas had, has to say from, from a, a, a regulator's point of view. What are the opportunities for integration as far as the aviation sector is concerned? One, uh, our <coughs> markets are disintegrated <coughs> and they are very small markets. So uh, regionally and continentally. Uh, integration would be the wisest thing to do now as than pursuing termite economies. So the, when you look at the current population, estimated population of the, of the region, of the five East African countries, it's close to 160 million people. And we've, we've been observing some growth in the middle class right. of our people. And they, it's taken that affluent people will normally use their transport. So the more we come together, the more we benefit from this growing market and the affluent population. Right. More than that, the more we come together, the more we synergize on our meager resources because aviation is very expensive in terms of maintaining safety and security. So the initiatives that we have seen in the recent past, like uh, a unified airspace, like uh, pulling together all our resource people, inspectors and maintenance uh, crew is one way that indicates that we, would, we stand to benefit a lot from coming together. T talking of the benefits, uh, let me just bring in Marceline again. Uh, there are concerns about taxation, about landing fees, uh, you know, and even the infrastructure because when we are negotiating at the table and um, the Kenyan operators want to fly into Rwanda or Rwanda wants to fly into Entebbe, uh, there are all those uh, bureaucratic issues that are there. Uh, Marceline, from an investment point of view, 
What are the opportunities for integration in aviation? Okay, Bonnie, um, you know, when you're looking at this, I, I basically will refer back to even the Middle East careers and what is happening there. They have received a lot of government support coming from these countries, and the government actually in the Middle East countries normally supports the airline industry. So again, coming back to East Africa, ideally we would expect a reduction on the taxes to benefit the airline industry, which will, be, which will actually drive their positive growth on the bottom line, especially if you are to look at the return on the invested capital, which has actually been, at very, which has been very low in the recent past. Again, also looking at things like uh, landing fees, these are a cost to the airlines when you're looking at the cost of sales. So I expect that such a move by the government when they're trying to drive the support that they actually need to give to the airline industry is actually going to boost the books of these airlines. And in tandem, they are going to give a, bear, a good return to the investors. However, they should actually be looking at what is happening in other markets because ideally, if this is to happen, if you are to see a government support coming from the three countries, then definitely the integration of the East African community is going to actually be a big plus to the development and the growth of the airline industry. Interesting, I see Patrick wants to, to, to jump in on that. Patrick, sure, go ahead. The open sky policy, Yadoya Musukro uh, uh, agreements, uh, will be the only thing that actually will uh, make the opportunity, uh, the opportunity costs go lower. What I mean by that is that uh, if I was free to move as an operator anywhere I want in East Africa, uh, not given conditions or given also a fifth freedom out of anywhere in this region, not only will it impact when on the consumer because there will be more people flying right. and the, pri the ticket price will go lower. You know? mm -hmm. So if there was a political will, and there is a political will from our, uh, our leaders to even push it further, uh, the open sky policy will s will will uh, would solve a lot of problems. There is political will, but uh, things are not moving as fast as we exactly. Be. Let me just bring in Fred. 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 Uh, <laughs> from a business point of view, you are right in the heart of these things uh, as a freight forward, uh, uh, and obviously any sort of delays and any sort of uh, roadblocks would affect your profitability. Uh, give us a sense of. How then do we leverage on these opportunities, especially when we talked about government policy and support? Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm a, I'm a, as a business people, uh, when we are looking at this as an opportunity, uh, we also uh, have been facing more challenges. And these challenges have been there before integration <laughs> of this region. Right. Since they have come now, the integration of the region, we should we was looking to get immediately this opportunity starting now being in place, something being implemented. We are saying, when you are saying airspace negotiation, we are saying landing permit or landing fees or navigation fees, other fees, there should be, first of all, what is called harmonization. Right. The harmonization should be uh, between our ESC countries. That was, I think, the political will who are there already. Our government policy are there, the willing is there, but what we are lacking now is the implementation. Right. And it took more long time. When it took a long time, that's where we lose more the opportunity of the economy. Uh, number two, the opportunity are there like in exportation, when you make an export from Rwanda, uh, an example, or from Nairobi, or from Uganda, from Tanzania. We are exporting from uh, our region to the uh, other countries. Mm -hmm. Or we are making even the import also from that person. Right. But when you are looking at how we, we should have the, uh, the, the, the aviation growth with more cargo are coming here, right. uh, we, which make now cheap or loss on the rate where to give us the opportunity to export our fresh right. products. Fred, let me just jump in. You've mentioned cargo, and uh, obviously that's a space that you operate in. But we've seen cargo, cargo transportation is not where we'd want it to be as far as the, the region is, is concerned. Uh, I've seen examples in Kenya where farmers get uh, uh, contracts to transport their produce, but they can't meet the requirements because either uh, the stipulation is different or the standards for the new market. What are the specific challenges that you face as far as cargo transportation? Uh, uh, thank you so much for the question. The first challenge we face, it not comes from our, our, our labor, our countries. First of all, it comes the way we are exporting to. Right. Because when you go in the regulation, the air books. The country of destination. The country of destination. Right. When you go to the air books, it, it shows you well. The problem, first of all, the problem we have, you have to run. You have to have to be, uh, to be uh, having like a, uh, let me say, people should learn and look and lead the books. Right. When you're exporting the goods to the other country, destination, you should know what's the requirement of the cargo you are sending there. What's they have to be the packaging? 
what are the minimum requirement required by that country. Sometimes we export without knowing what the requirement have been in that destination company country. Right. Second, there's some policy also who delays the documents or document, documents who have been delaying also by our policy government also to be initial or to be initial so on the time. Right. When they delay, already the aircraft or the aviation cannot wait. The time is there, it's just counting so money. So that is an internal problem. It's an internal problem. Right. But the biggest aspect we should have what we call also in the aviation also training mm -hmm. to uh, train, uh, train our people to know how to make the export, train our importer, our business people to know when it's in the farmers, when it is in, the, in the agriculture. They should know when I'm exporting this agriculture to the destination, US and Europe, right. what's the document required there, what's the requirement there. Right. I think it's important also to train to, our Talking about education, there's a gentleman <laughs> who is agreeing with you. <laughs> uh, what is the mandate of the authority as far as promoting ex, uh, cargo exploitation? Because he's mentioned the whole point about uh, training of the players in this space. Uh, what is your, does your mandate cover that? Uh, our mandate purely covers safety oversight. And currently the CA cohabits with airports management and air navigation services. So where we meet the gentleman then is on aer aerodromes or airport for that matter. And the regulations are very clear. And by the way, at the regional level, we've been able to harmonize all our regulations. What remains now is the implementation, expedited implementation of these regulations, which is one very big milestone. At least all the five uh, countries have harmonized the regulations that govern the industry. And as far as CAG is concerned, there are certain restrictions here and beyond that uh, cargo freighters meet. But there are also standards that need to be followed uh, that conform to international requirements. So it's up to us to make sure that we are actually conforming and up to the, jo to the, to the standards that have been set internationally right. in terms of quality and, uh, and, and efficiency because you require to be certified by other international cargo freight organizations and data for that matter. So if you qualify, we should, there must be a level field. The restrictions that there is would be easily managed through the region. Because in the Europe, what they have done is they have created a single market. Mm -hmm. And this is what we are trying to achieve. Hopefully, we get there. So if we are able to make our voice heard as the block, as a regional block, it's going to make it easier for our traders, our businessmen, to trade with Europe and other parts of the world. Right. Uh, Patrick, let me just bring you in this. Uh, how do we grow? I know maybe cargo is not up your alley, but how do we uh, promote cargo transportation in the region? How do you promote cargo transportation in the region? By, by putting in place, let me tell you something. First of all, you have to understand that most of the time the cargo that is coming here is unbalanced, meaning that uh, the, in our region you have most of the cargo players coming in right. full and they're going back empty. Which How is not good for business. Which, which is not good <laughs> for business. Right. How do we change that? Not only it goes hand in hand with what uh, the DG Siles, uh, DGRC was saying, is that we need to standardize our level of, uh, of product that we have, and we need to be consistent. And that's the biggest problem. To be we need to be consistent. How do you come up with a product that is actually of high quality, of, uh, of uh, competitive, but uh, not only at the regional level, but also an international level? but at the same time with the standards that are required that's actually will be in compliance with what the regulator is requiring and what also the regional block is requiring, right. which uh, emphasizes actually on exporting, exporting outside of Rwanda. Uh, and I do believe that they, now they do now have a packaging also, a company that is doing that. How we, how we put it actually in music, get, let's get all the players together, right. sit down, and come up with a, a roadmap to do it. Right. I don't see. Uh, before, before I get back to Fred, uh, uh, Marceline, you've been having, uh, you've been hearing this conversation about cargo, and obviously it's a big part of trade. Uh, again, from an investor point of view, what do you feel top of mind are some of the things that are hindering improved cargo performance in the region? Basically, I would be looking at the trade levels in the East African region. And again, if you are to look at how trading patterns have been, we have actually been seeing a lot of decline in trade levels. 
some we have seen a lot of like I'll give an example of the Mira ban that was done in the UK whereby they say that they no longer want Mira in, in UK. Again, if you were to look at that and being that Mira was a heavy was, was contributing heavily to the cargo cargo revenue, then definitely that will lead to, will lead to a, a decline in our cargo but our cargo revenues al, al, around the East African airspace. Then again, I think also now strengthening those um, agreements, the trading agreements are, uh, within the East African first, that will be a very key factor to consider so that we can actually enhance our trading um, trading levels within East Africa even before looking beyond East Africa. Because again, if you are able to rely with each other, we are able to drive our growth together. If you are able to actually do exports for between, uh, uh, between different countries within East Africa, then definitely again we are able to help the cargo revenues grow. But if at, if at all the East African communities as a bloc is not able to agree and to sit down and come up with trading agreements that are actually in favor of East Africa, then definitely we are going to lose on that end. But again, I still feel like there's a lot that can be done in the, in the cargo business, even before we look at the passenger traffic numbers. Interesting. Fred, do you want to say something? Do you agree with her? Yeah, I agree. Oh, yes, do you agree? Yes. Uh, as I say, the, the opportunity we are, we are looking for the East Africa as a region aspect. We are looking how to harmonize. When you get cargo, when you are looking now, as uh, Kenya is doing, when you see there how many cargo flights are coming there, when I'm talking about cargo, it's we are looking about the rate, about the price. When the price comes low, it, it gives the people opportunity to make business, export or import. Right. Second, when you are looking here in our country, also how we are doing, cargo is doing well, but at least we have not more cargo out there. We have two different types of the, car, the, car, the, the, the air flight. Right. Aviation has the passenger, passenger airline, which is combined. It means combined passenger airline and cargo. When also cargo full. When it's combined, it makes more higher price. Right. But when it's a cargo full, it makes low, it will very price which comes now to be a competitive market. Right. What, you, what government is doing now today as a particular mention that uh, Rwanda government are being in place what, uh, working with the Minister of Agriculture, right. NAEB, which now they are investing more, even private business people are investing more in the agriculture. We are promoting in the future, uh, or one year or two next years, we, have, we will be able to have more cargo, where the cargo can land to Kigali and carrying more cargo, exporting to do uh, other countries. That's why you see sometimes the opportunity are there, but the cargo or freight can't, ca freight can't come here right. where you go empty. Right. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a loss right. that they are doing. But when it comes mm -hmm. out the region, when they pick from Nairobi, it can connect what we call interconnection. They can connect from Nairobi, mm -hmm. pick the cargo either 10 tons or 20 tons Kigali. Mm -hmm. They pick from Uganda 20 tons to Nairobi 30 tons. Then they go back full. That's where I can say integrated of region have given us the opportunity, but the implementation of those opportunities. Right. That we are, as a business people, we are looking from the regulators, from the government, which they are putting in place. Also, I'm emphasizing for the business people, yes. we should also be able in the capacity investing more in the opportunity as agriculture, as our minerals, and then we'll be able to export pharmacies, right. to export more from our region. That way we can even have more, uh, more economic growth right. than importing more money. I know, I know the DG wants to jump in. As yeah. you jump in, uh, Mr. DG, also uh, give us a sense of are there uh, policies that are East Africa friendly in terms of promoting cargo uh, and, and, and freight movement? Well, uh, cargo in this case, we are talking about freight cargo that flies by, by a plane. And look at uh, our economies, they are largely agriculture. And to a large extent, they, we depend on minerals. These are bulky products we are talking about that are not going to be colored, coltan, the minerals, mm. coffee, tea, and others. What you probably need to do is to improve on value added. Mm. We improve, we, we need to work on value added. If coltan can be processed in Rwanda, in Kenya, in Tanzania, and the other neighboring countries, or co the continent at large, and we export processed products. If our beef can be, we, you know, every day we are eating beef which comes from Europe, mm. well packeted, pa pa packed, you know, well mm. packed. We eat beans which come from France yes. in tins. <laughs> we have better beans in the hills of Rwanda. Right. So we need to improve on value added. And this will enhance uh, cargo freight because then they will be in smaller volumes 
but with very high value. Right. So this speaks to a lot of investment, like Fred has said, that there is need for increased investment in this space because at times you cannot export it because the condition it is in, no one really wants it. Exactly. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Interesting, gentlemen. Uh, we'll, we're just getting into the break, uh, the, the first break. Uh, but on the other half of this break, I'd like us to address the issues of the safety because we can talk and say we need to integrate and we need to improve. But if our skies are not safe, no one is going to fly. So on the other half of this uh, conversation, we'll be looking at the safety uh, of the skies uh, in the East African region as well as that all-important conversation um, of the global oil prices. Remember, you're watching the East African Focus Debate on Aviation. This uh, today on CNBC Africa. Uh, on my panel, I've had Maslin Gatebi, who's a research analyst uh, from Genji's capital in Kenya. She's seated in Nairobi. Fred Seka is the chairman of the Rwanda Freight Forwarders Association. Patrick Nkuliyimfura is the MD of Akagera Aviation, as well as the Director General of the Rwanda Avia uh, Civil Aviation Authority, Silas Udahemuka. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back. You are on the East African Focus debate this time round, talking about the aviation sector. On my panel, Patrick Nkuliyimfura is the MD of Akagera uh, Aviation. Also, I have Fred Seka, Chairman of the Rwanda Freight Forwarders Association and the Director General of the Rwanda Civil Aviation Authority, Silas uh, Udahemuka. Also, joining us from Nairobi is Maslin Gatebi, Research Analyst with Ganges Capital. Maslin, let me just start off with you. Uh, you've had that conversation about the safety, about the quality, about the investments. Um, just to wrap up this bit about uh, our capacities, what can be done to improve the capacity, especially if we're talking about uh, cargo and freight? Because we've already talked about having policies that promote this. From an investor point of view, from the private sector, what can be done to improve this capacity? Um, Bonnie, thank you. Um, I think looking at uh, enhancing our capacity in the cargo freight, I think first of all I'll be looking at how our connectivity is with these other countries. Because ideally looking at um, the time frame taken to maybe transport something from one country to another, I would expect that when we are able to transport things faster, we are able to save, we are able to reduce on the, on the perishable, especially things going back the going by the perishable goods therefore enhancing also a lot of confidence from the business uh, and the farmers as well who actually are, are waiting from the other side for for a benefit from the cargo that has, has actually been transported so I would expect a greater connectivity and a greater conven convenience coming from the end whereby we, when we have these open ups or opening up of the skies you're going to have this greater connectivity we are talking about and you're also going to have this greater convenience in terms in times of in terms of time and also the fare the fares that are actually charged when transporting um, in the aviation industry indeed uh, gentlemen and ladies like us to shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, the safe skies for the region and this is a very contentious issue we've seen efforts to open up direct flights between say Kenya and America or Kenya and Israel or Rwanda in a certain country in Uganda. We've seen uh, a different set of requirements being put on the table and one of it has been safety. Um, let me start from the DG because this really is <laughs> you, right under your job uh, description. Are you happy with the sort of safety measures that have been put not just for Rwanda but uh, flying across the region? Uh, well, uh, ICAO has got more than 190 member states. ICAO is a UN agency that is responsible for safety. And we all subscribe to this agency, much as we do to the UN. For any amendment standard to be approved, all member states will be involved. Right. And every contracting state has got the right to defer with that uh, either in newly introduced uh, standard or recommendation. But you have got to give reasons. And when you give reasons and you want to maintain your defer, deference, you give alternative measures of compliance with safety. So safety, like I said, in as far as the aviation industry is concerned, it's a time-tested. By the way, this is the most safest mode of transport. Right. And uh, efforts in terms of technology, in terms of training, skills, and blah, 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 
have been extensively applied to ensure the safety. On the regional perspective, uh, all member states are now above the average. Right. The Abuja Declaration of 2010 wanted Africans to at least be 60 percent, mm -hmm. and uh, beyond that would be a domain of others, not Africans. But I'm proud to say that most African states, East African at least, East African states, have gone over and above, uh, above the average. The biggest challenge is the skills. The skills of inspectors, the skills of pilots, the skills of maintenance engineers. Today, both uh, Boeing and IATA have got a backlog of 12,500 aircraft. Right. All this will require pilots and maintenance engineers. So you will see a drift of the few skilled engineers and pilots going to mainly Asia and Europe because Asia is going to consume more than 30 percent of the next uh, 10 years uh, demand of, of aviation. So what we have done in our own ways is to synergize, to harmonize, to put together our skills, to put together our inspectors. For example now at the regional level, East Africa regional level, all medical examiners, medical services for aviation will be centralized in uh, Nairobi right. and the safety office is, is, is in Entebbe and all inspectors are required to meet regularly much as we do as DGs of aviation to assess how we are compri complying in terms of uh, safety and for that matter making sure that we sustain it. Right. Uh, Patrick you've worked for Rwanda before and uh, I mean speak to us a little bit about this conversation about the skilled personnel and the talent that we need um, that obviously is linked to safety uh, every time we talk about we need to empower more people we need to train more pilots more uh, safety operators but every time we train them they are take uh, they're taken up by other markets and we still find our markets one day Kenya Airways uh, Air Uganda employing a lot of foreign based talent give us a sense of how things are right now the way things are right now is that there was a very good initiative um, um, that we actually are very happy about it, of coming up with a company called ATL that would cater for all aviation stakeholders uh, and tourism and logistic into one holding. And we are at Akagera Aviation. We're happy to have been actually uh, will be much more training all aviation stakeholders mm -hmm. into the different fields that we're talking about. It is true, I there is a shortage of skills when it comes to the aviation. Um, and it's a phenomenon that is not unique to our region, but it's, it's a global, uh, it's a global uh, issue when it comes to capacity building in Africa. We, we anticipate that over the next 10 years, for instance, when it comes to Africa, we need more than 20,000 pilots. Where would they come from? You have three or four big schools in Africa um, that actually give standards uh, that are accept acceptable at, a, at an international level. Right. Um, our role will be to uh, get to those standards through a center of excellence that we are actually pushing right now um, in order to be able to be not only compliant with the regulator, right. but also be compliant at international level. Uh, so we can actually be able not only to compete, but to have very skilled people in it to ensure that safety is always uh, not compromised. Right. Uh, Fred, let me just bring you in. Uh, you may probably not deal with pilots directly, uh, but there are a lot of other skilled talent uh, in that value chain uh, that we're talking about. From a safety point of view, are you happy with the measures put in place, say, by the DG and other players in the region uh, to ensure that your cargo is actually uh, handled well? Uh, thank you. Um, when you're talking about safety, everyone is looking the safety first, number one. Even if I'm an exporter or importer, I have cargo but I have to look fast in the safety. So when the regulators put in the place the requirement to be mitigated of the cargoes and the safety, for us as an operator, what we required is to implement what have been put in place with the regulator. And uh, not hindering, hindering our business. What it's doing is making it comfortable and the security and the secure what we are sending to other countries. Right. What I may say, the, the security, even the cargo, in terms of the security, 
we train even our, we have our, our training schools, whether we train even our, our importer and exporters. When you are sending the export, the cargo to the other countries, from Rwanda to Kenya, from Rwanda to Europe or USA, they should first having this requirement for the security. It's in a scan, they have, you have the scanners, you have to scan the cargo. That's a safety. Right. So when we are not require, we are not meeting these requirements, that cargo cannot be shipped, or cannot right. be sent, it, it will be back. So that means we have been seeing more issues. We have been seeing more, um, more, more damage, more accidents, who have been happening because the cargo, where people can ignore one side of the cargo. Right. What I may say, I may say we are happy with the requirements, which all the world we are looking for the safety because the world have been coming more uh, looking safety because of these changes have been coming. Right. So for us, for where the operator are putting in place, we are there to implement. We'll be happy to implement. We are it. for where as long as what we are looking at as a cargo is to reduce paperwork right. and the administration. Right. But the requirement for the safety. We are for and we'll get to that point of reducing paperwork. The DG will tell us why we have <laughs> too much paperwork. But earlier on, Maslin uh, made a very important point about what is hurting the aviation space in Africa, and she mentioned Ebola. Um, uh, currently, two big issues uh, the past year have been Ebola. Uh, now there's a concern about terrorism in the region. However, we also cannot ignore the spread of the Zika virus. Uh, Maslin, give us uh, an understanding of how big a deal these threats to air safety uh, are, especially for the East African. Looking at the three threats that you've just earlier mentioned, I think how I look at them is that most of the air traffic coming, or rather the passenger traffic in the region is mainly from within. So again, looking at the passenger numbers, if for instance you look <coughs> at Kenya Airways, which is a company that I have closely studied, you will see that the 50, above 50% 50 were contributed, or 50% um, passengers were from Africa, but this has actually been on a decline to as low as 45%, and this has actually been attributed to some of those factors that we are mentioning around. And if you are to look at the East African space, and or also like the East African airlines, most of the passenger demand has actually been coming from the within Africa, intra-Africa intra um, region. So basically, with some of these factors ailing the economy, we would expect a lot of that to trigger in into the into the aviation industry in East Africa. Therefore, I would still expect unless um we, we see a resolve towards these three factors, which actually has actually been on progress because if you are to look at the Ebola attacks, we have seen the government actually lifting some of the bans and now KQ can actually go to Sierra Leone and um, uh, Liberia. So again, looking at terrorism, I think it's an issue which is actually under, uh, the progress is actually being undertaken in, in regards to resolving the issue and also other things. So I believe we are in progress and we are actually doing well to curb such of some of these um, factors are actually ailing the, the industry. But again, nevertheless, I still expect that um, passenger demand aside, I will still expect that these factors will not really hinder cargo, fra cargo freight demand in the, in the market because these are not factors that are directly tra um, affecting the cargo, the cargo demand in the region. Right. Let me just bring in DG because this, this <laughs> touches a lot on what you do. Let's talk about the coordination that needs to happen because Rwanda Aviation Authority cannot deal with safety or with Ebola or with terrorism or Zika virus as a, alone. Uh, Kenya and, and Uganda also cannot deal with this in isolation. Are there efforts to integrate uh, these campaigns to improve safety in the region uh, as far as these threats are concerned? Well, first of all, uh, uh, the Ebola, terrorism, I mentioned it, political strife and other things, we not only affect aviation. Aviation is actually an engine that triggers other engines. And passengers do not fly to enjoy turbulences right. and sit in a tight cockpit or uh, air aircraft. They fly for other reasons. So when the passengers don't fly from West Africa or from uh, wherever, whichever part of the continent or, or gro world, there are other sectors of business that are affected. And that's why we should look at aviation as an enabler, as an engine that starts other engines, right. other economic engines. And that's why governments, especially our government, is putting enormous investment in aviation. Because our government believes okay. that aviation is an enabler, it's a major driver to our economy. 
and has for, for that matter been earmarked as one of the major flagship projects in, in this country. When you come to harmonization of measures that have got to deal with uh, challenges that sa of safety, at uh, the regional level, we have got what we call CASOA, the Civil Aviation Safety and Security Oversight Agency. Right. That is where all experts in aviation meet to review the current status of safety, mm -hmm. gaps that, that are there, and how to best uh, fill them. And uh, at an international level, we have got ICAO, and ICAO has got regional blocks, which they call regional safety organization uh, uh, agencies. And we will have the East African, which has more than 20 countries that is seated in Nairobi, the ICAO regional office, East and South African office. And then we have got the global office in Montreal. And now these are agencies or bodies that measure and continue to monitor trends of safety and advise on uh, terrorism threats to aviation will continue to be there. Things like Ebola and the like will continue to be there. We only need to be proactive Right. And in very good time, anticipate what is likely to have and create some buffer, right. which is very hard though to determine. Nobody knew we would have uh, Ebola in West Africa. Right. Nobody knew 10 years ago that we would have strife in Burundi. Nobody knew that we would have all these things that are around us. And this, in one way or the other, affects the number of passengers movement of people and goods and other services. Right. Let me just bring another question to Fred Brotter. What about the paperwork? Too much paperwork. <laughs> and, and this is not just for the Rwandan aviation. Even flying across Kenya or Uganda, there's just too much paperwork. Well, that is the old style of doing things. Aviation is one industry that has actually seen and continue to enjoy the use of technology. You don't, we used to do my passenger manifest, we used to do flight plans, we used to do mm, briefs. These things are now uh, integrated in an aircraft. A pilot does not need to get out of his cockpit to go in the navigation office to file his flight plan. It's right there. For example, now Airbus, which right. Rwanda is acquiring in a few months to come, they have got what they call electronic flight bag. Electronic flight bag, it's like an iPad. He sits in front of the pilot, and all manuals, all procedures will be there for him to do. So those, and uh, I'm proud to say that in Rwanda, we have moved this step further to maximize on use of technology, and we have therefore eliminated the use of uh, paperwork. Right. Yeah. As an operator, Patrick, uh, what guarantees that does Akagera give uh, its flyers uh, as regard to safety? Good question. You know, you have to admit one thing. Um, the threat nowadays are more and more sophisticated. Um, it's, uh, we started uh, seeing uh, the, the trends like the drones that are in airspace, or it can be uh, those lasers that are pointed on an aircraft, and that can actually disturb how to control that, how to anticipate those threats that are much more sophistic right. sophisticated, takes, um, like the DG was saying, takes that people sit down on, around the table and say, how do we deal with it? It's not something that actually Akagera has a response. It's, it has to be dealt within a certain forum that actually uh, uh, enhance security for all and safety for all. Right. What we are doing is that we are being proactive because actually we mainly do charters. Uh, we uh, all our crew and safety uh, and I mean all our crew, our flight oper uh, our flight personnel undergo uh, AFSEC. Uh, AFSEC is aviation security courses. It's a recurrent. It's, it's a requirement, mm -hmm. and we try also to do what we develop. We have developed what you call a, a pilot forum, whereby we exchange on the different incidents that can happen and how to prevent them. Right. Um, so we do, uh, we do use three or four different techniques mm -hmm. that are uh, extremely efficient um, and it has helped us for, uh, for the time being. But it needs to be addressed as, as an industry, not as one operator. Uh, right. as such.
interesting. Gentlemen and ladies, I'd like us to shift gears yet again and uh, probably I'd like uh, Marceline Gatebi to set the stage um, for us on this one. Uh, global oil prices. This is a big, big concern for the aviation sector. We've seen different hedging efforts by different players. In some instances, they haven't worked. Uh, from an investment point of view, Marceline, uh, how big a deal are the falling prices right now? And what must African aviation players do to ensure that they keep on the skies in the next five to ten years? You've uh, probably seen that uh, Bloomberg focus saying that in the next coming years, oil will pretty much be worthless. To start with, I think fuel volatility has been the biggest austere story in African airspace, especially now looking at how prices have plummeted to as low as even the 20s, below 30 band. And again, looking at that and becoming from a point whereby most of the airlines have been hedging against these uh, volatility in oil prices, most of these hedges haven't actually played out well for them because, again, they have been on the losing end. Um, like, if you look at Kenya Airways, you have seen for, uh, the, 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 oil, the, 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 the forex, uh, the losses coming from the oil prices, they have been very high. The hedge losses, they have actually unrealized and realized losses from the hedges. Again, looking at this and looking at the kind of hedges that most of these airlines have actually put in place, you would expect that going forward, if they are to have any hedges, they're actually going to really put up hedges that are actually going to benefit them because right now they've, they have actually hurt the industry. And we, we expect now going forward, as even the oil prices continue plummeting, we, we, we're really sitting in a position whereby the oil prices are not expected to rebound soon. So we expect that even as airlines consider putting up hedges, even as like for instance KQ is actually going to expire their their hedges in March 2017 we would expect that Kenya Airways and the other airlines like Rwanda Airways and also Ethiopia Airlines to put up hedges that actually are going to really be in favor of them for the coming next maybe five to ten years so that actually they don't undergo what they have gone through this year because actually if you look at the books the biggest um, the, the biggest hit has actually come from the fuel prices Interesting, Marcelin. Fred, this directly affects you because every time uh, there is a difference in pricing, whether it goes up, whether it goes below the hedging price, uh, that price will be transferred to you. Uh, from where you see it, what is the best way forward to ensure that in the midst of all the chaos that are happening as far as global prices are concerned, uh, movement of uh, cargo, movement of people, and our airplanes remain on the sky? I think when we are looking for the aspect of the oil price in the world market, there's some time which you don't have any control. Right. Even the airline or the uh, SIVA, uh, SIVA authorities, right. they don't have any have that control. Yeah, because no one saw this coming. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. we never know when to be coming. But what we are looking for is the uh, mm -hmm. airlines and the SIVA authorities having their stores, which is now bigger than what it was having now. They have to put in place their plans, how they can plan for five years, ten years where if the law for oil have been putting down, where can be storing more, and then where can help us to operate. Where we are looking, because in the price of the oil is coming up, down, up, down, it depends on the market, world market. The, and there, it affects automatically the business people. Right. When it affects the freight forward, when I'm saying, I'm talking on behalf of the importers and exporters, which have been in, a, in aviation also, the aviation is the, is the, the one for the, 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 the equipment who are using more, the fewer who are looking on that aspect whereby what is he gaining when they are coming to Rwanda? When their boxes are coming in Rwanda, what is he gaining, what is he carrying from Rwanda's export? Whereby it can be able to pay the, the fuel have been consumed from Nairobi to Kigali. Right. When they back to Amsterdam, what the cargo are having now, uh, they are carrying now. So what I'm saying in the plan of the oil, it will be depending with the worldwide market. Second also, it will be depending also the plan for the, our operate, our regulators, right. where they are putting in the place. I think on this way, uh, for us as a business people, when it's coming, we look at also how the price comes high. It comes in the competition in the market. Are we competitive in the market? Or when the price comes high, we didn't compete. Or do we say that, that how the business is starting to be down? Right. Um, may say in, the, in, in one more, I can say uh, our operators, our regulators, I should look at on that aspect, how to plan for it, how right. to plan for long term, not plan for today. By next year saying, if I put up, automatically the price starting to be up. Interesting. Uh, Patrick, what has been your hedging strategy? And also, I, I know you're very happy now with the fuel pricing, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but uh, what has been the Akajera's uh, 
experience as far as relating to oil? Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think that you, one must admit that aviation is one of the sectors that where you have uh, very high capital intensive and a very small margin. Any increase of 5 or 10 percent or decrease of 5 to 10 percent right. have an impact on your balance sheet, on your, your bottom line. So our, our approach has always been to be not to try to balance, uh, not to pass it on to the clients because it's also affect our business. But at the same time, you don't want to be in a loss position right. uh, uh, that can compromise. We have this year, like you were saying, we've been, we've been very happy. It has actually impacted positively on and our... it's bound to continue. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's actually what, we, what we're doing is that we're trying to save for the future because we never know how it will uh, change. We, uh, we have been uh, putting aside and trying to capitalize on the, 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 the weak, I mean, or the low price right. on oil. Interesting. And hoping for the uh, future to be... Uh, don't that. worry, I bear good news. It will stay there for a little <laughs> longer. <laughs> Gentlemen and yes. ladies, we need to bring this to a landing. Uh, but our final uh, point that we need to raise has been about competition, and we cannot ignore this. We've seen um, the Gulf Airlines getting into this market, and they are a big threat, especially when we talk about our legacy carriers like Rwanda, Kenya Airways, Uganda, Air, Ethiopian Airlines. They seem to be facing some very steep competition. Uh, in a sense of just uh, probably just wrapping this up for us, uh, Maslin, um, how can we, if possible, uh, brace ourselves for this uh, invasion by the Gulf Airlines? Competition is bound to be there. I believe for any effective market, we have to have this competition. So basically, uh, I would expect that the opening up of the skies is actually going to bring greater connectivity around the region. And basically, if you are to look at it now from the point of view of an African space, we can actually dominate the African space whereby at least the Kenyan or rather the East African airlines can actually do a lot of, um, they can actually derive a lot of revenue from the African space even beyond looking uh, at the international spaces. So first of all, I believe a greater connectivity is actually going to be a very big contributor. Right. And also looking also at the kind of integration, the, the, the benefits of scale that actually this integration is going to bring about. I believe once people are working together and actually when the integration is uh, already set up, we are going to work together towards seeing that we have better pricing mechanisms in our tickets and thus we are, we are of course going to fight against this competition with better pricing of our tickets and better services. So I believe it's something that we can still fight against even looking from a domestic point of view. Interesting. Mostly it's very positive there but gentlemen I'll just give each of us a, a minute uh, to comment about that competition bit from the Gulf Airlines as you give your closing comments. Let's start with Patrick. I totally agree with what Marty was saying. Uh, open sky has to be a reality if you have to, uh, if, uh, if you have to grow and face that competition. Uh, without integration and implementation of the uh, ESC integration, uh, we would not be able to compete. Uh, I think that there is uh, many synergies that we can actually find together uh, as operator, but as a block, if we move as a block and not if we move as a single country. Right. That's the point. As termite economies, as the DJ called them. Right? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, as a uh, competition, always we are looking how to compete with others. But uh, for us, as a region of East Africa, I may say, first of all, have to put together, have to come to, come to one, have to implement what is required as with our, our, our head of systems. We agreed to harmonize our region uh, rules and integration. We start working as a one country. There we just reduce more, 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 more these taxes and more uh, fees, where it gives the uh, East Africans the opportunity to now to learn or to lead this market of Africa. Right. And then from there, for us, to help us of the business people to fly more, to make more business, to increase our economic capacity. Thank you. DG, take us home. Yeah, what is important is we look at the end goal as the benefits to the air traveler. And the liberalization of airspace is one way of achieving it. I'm not looking at the Gulf carriers as invaders, they are competitors. And uh, Africa at large is facing stiff competition from all sectors, education, health, agriculture. We have meat and beans 
in the supermarkets from uh, Europe and all over. So we need to reorganize ourselves. And as far as aviation is concerned, the recent initiatives by the, our heads of state, Northern Corridor especially, have even uh, suggested that we do mass and multilateral air service agreements which would see this uh, region as a one market and uh, having one voice. We have moved ahead in doing a uh, unified uh, airspace. We are only waiting to operationalize it and the experts are working on the roadmap. So the more we unify our smaller disintegrated markets, the more we stand to benefit from the, the benefits of the aviation industry. Right. Well, if you're there, that brings us to the end of the East African Focus debate, this time around looking at the aviation sector. My esteemed panelists have been from Nairobi, Maslin Gatebi, who is the research analyst with Genji's Capital. Also, I've had Patrick Nkuli, Nkuli Yimfura, I hope I got that correct, is the managing director at Akagera Aviation. Uh, we also had Fred Seka, chairman of the Rwanda Freight Forwarders Association, and Silas Udahemuka, is the director general of the Rwanda Civil Aviation Authority. My name is Bonnie Tunya, and thank you for watching.